Welcome to a live event in which you're as important as anyone here in the studio. In the next 45 minutes, many of you may become real-life detectives. We need help tonight to solve 20 major inquiries that have proved difficult to crack. We start with one of the most dramatic acts of heroism. Take uh, an unassuming contract cleaner who comes across an armed robbery. He acted almost like James Bond. His daring shows how guns can have unpredictable results. They don't always stop passers-by from astonishing acts of courage. And what's more, lots of other shoppers have come forward to help with our reconstruction. I do my weekly shop between one and two, normally on a Friday. And this time, I saw this guy sitting on this bench. He was sitting by himself, hadn't got any shopping with him. And it, I don't think he was waiting for anybody in particular. Seemed a bit odd. It wasn't the first time I'd seen him either. He'd been there a couple of weeks beforehand. Then, nearly two weeks later... Hi, good morning. Hello, uh, I'm calling about the, the Ford uh, Cortina that yes. you've got for sale in the uh, Auto Trader. Yes, it's still here. Oh, good. You've not sold it yet? No, not yet. Brilliant. Yeah, so you've got uh, another coil there. Yes, yeah, so I've had a bit of trouble with it misfiring and I put a new coil on it. That seemed to cure it. Yeah. Okay. I've got a new cam belt on there as well. Right. That seems all right. Uh, back in a minute. Okay, right. I never saw the car that he turned up in. Perhaps somebody dropped him off around the corner or something. I don't know. Never, never really given any thought. We better check it out. Yeah, all check right. it out. And, well. The main guy who had the money who was obviously in charge. Was thin, youngish, probably 30, pale complexion, short cropped blonde hair. The hair looked as if it might have been bleached at some time to get the effect. Right, I need your full name and address, please. Yeah, you've got the right name there. And it's yep. Waghorn Road. Yep. Yeah, that's the right number. Yep. It's Kenton, K E N T O N. Yes. Harrow. Yes. Middlesex. Yes, thank you. Can you see the mileage on the speed? Yeah. Gave him all the paperwork I'd got with the car and off he went. That's it. I thought, cool, got rid of that. Thank goodness for that. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you. Two hours later in Peterborough, Cambridgeshire, this woman had just left Safeways. I was on my way home from the shop and I pulled out behind this car and followed it down Paston Lane. and then it turned into the pub. Next morning, Friday the 2nd of August. The Ford Cortina arrived at Safeways at 11.35 and was in the car park for the next four hours. I'd finished my shopping and I noticed a beige Ford Cortina estate parked across from mine. I'd noticed it earlier when I went into the supermarket I looked at it and thought it odd because there was a man sat in it on his own, but he was still there when I came back out, parked in the same position, and he'd been joined by a second man. They just looked as if they were possibly up to something. In the short time it took me to walk from my car to the store, a gentleman to my left caught my eye. Uh, a number of thoughts rang through my head about uh, suspicious characters loitering in car parks uh, with a view to uh, stealing things from cars. I decided I was going to give him quite a good eyeballing to make him know that I'd seen him in order to deter him perhaps from breaking into my car. Andrew Maplethorpe was on his way home from work and was finishing a cigarette before going in to get some shopping. Okay, Simon. Money! Now, yeah, give me that box! Get that! Come on! No! Give me the money! Let's go, you! Let's go! 
I just thought, could I do something to stop them? Then the driver says, shoot him, Graham, shoot him. And he's just standing there and he... bang. Shoot him, Graham! Shoot him! So I thought, you know, if somebody up there is looking after me, I mean, it's not every day you have a, a gun pointed at you and shot at. Um, and then I thought, you know, now what? Now what do I do? I really wanted to go all the way, you know, and stay on. I just wanted to stay on there until they got wherever they were going to go. Gone down Lincoln Road, Tony. Are you okay? Are you all right? Yeah, no, I'm all right. Are you I'm sure? Right. Yeah, no, I am. No, I'm fine. Just to see him point it at me was bad enough. And to pull the trigger as well. Mm. In fact, the gun misfired, and you know that because you recovered this from the scene. T tell us about this. One. Yes, that that is a blank uh, cartridge, and there's no way Andrew Mablethorpe would have known that at the time he saw the gun being pointed at him. He would have thought it was a real gun. That is a, a blank Mesco eight millimeter cartridge uh, for use in a in a replica nine millimeter uh, automatic pistol. How common are MESCO cartridges? Air inquiries show they're fairly, fairly rare. The uh, forensic laboratory at Huntingdon, which deals with firearms, that, that is the only one that they've ever come across. So can viewers help you in, the, in this, tracing where this came from? We'd like to know where it came from, but more importantly, we'd like to know of anybody who knows somebody who's got a, an, an automatic replica firearm and uses that type of ammunition. I gather, bizarre though it may seem, you can get these replicas and they look very, very real and authentic through mail order. Perhaps you can get this through mail order as well. There's a strong possibility. OK, we've also got in the studio these. These are cassettes that went missing in the raid. I mean, they're pretty distinctive, aren't they? Yes, they are. But without the label on there showing ten, ten pounds, they could be mistaken for, for drawers that go into a stacking unit in a warehouse. Yeah, now a couple of these are missing. Two of those are missing and they could be discarded on a rubbish dump or somewhere like that. OK, fine. Obviously you need more witnesses to the events in, in Peterborough. You also need to pe find people who saw that car, the, the, the Ford Cortina. Quite an old one, eh? What is it? It's a, a V-registered, uh, HLT 200V. That's correct. We know that uh, from the time it was purchased in Sandhurst to the time it was dumped in Peterborough, it had covered 144 miles. It's 115 miles from Sandhurst to Peterborough, so there's not many miles it's not accounted for. It must have been around Peterborough. OK, now, not shown in the film, but there was another vehicle you were trying to trace as well. Yes, this is a, a Ford Iveco truck. It's a, a white Euro hire vehicle, and it's got the, the uh, logo across the front, F Fleet Truck of the Year. Uh, we're anxious to trace and illuminate the driver of that that was seen on two or three occasions in the vicinity of the Lime Tree, the day before, the day of the robbery, and the day after. OK, that's the Lime Tree pub in Paston Lane in Peterborough around the 1st and 2nd of, of August. That is correct, yeah. There's a substantial reward... Here's the number, 0500 600 600. That's free here to the studio. Or you can ring the incident room direct. That's 01733 63232. That's Peterborough, 63232. Well, we've had a heartening response from viewers on the Russell murders, the killing of the family in Kent. One viewer may have been the last to see Lynn Russell alive. We also know that a man was seen driving down the lane towards her. And, as you may have heard, a hammer found in the hedge has not been forensically linked to the murder scene. However, officers are not ruling out its significance and inquiries continue. And one man identified by 14 viewers has now been eliminated. Several other names were put forward and the inquiry is clearly making progress, but police would obviously still like to hear from anyone else who may be able to help.
On our other reconstructions, first the bank robbery in Aberdeen. That was where an armed gang stole a sack of money, only to find it booby-trapped with red smoke. Well, they dumped it from their car while passers-by acted as spotters for the police. Dozens of viewers thought they recognised the robbers. Some gave the same name. Detectives are now following positive lines of inquiry on that one. And Janet Murgatroyd, two people gave the same name for the killer of the student battered late one night in Preston. Another viewer has triggered a further line of inquiry. There are strong leads on almost all the other cases last month, and one concerns this reconstructed head. This was the face recre recreated by the medical artist Richard Neve from a body discovered on a farm in Hampshire. The day after our programme, a viewer rang Crime Stoppers and identified the victim. He was Hajit Singh, sometimes known as Hajit Singh, a 40-year-old Punjabi from Essex. He was last seen on Tuesday, April the 9th, at a solicitor's office near his home in Ilford. If you knew him, if you knew his friends, if you lived near him in Grange Road, or if you saw him back in April, if you know anything about him or heard anything suspicious, please call us, 0500 600 600, or you can call the police in Netley. They're on 01703 456 902. That's a Southampton number, 456 902. Now, with some other faces you might know, here's Superintendent David Hatcher. In fact, these are faces you'll hope you haven't seen. This man, for example, he's Alfred Higgins, or at least that's the name he uses, but then lots of things he uses turn out to be fraudulent or forged. This is his flashy calling card. This is his classy-looking brochure. And this is an insurance document he issued. And take a careful look. Telishaw Motorist Club, complete with free phone number. In fact, it's all a con. If you have a car insurance with Telishaw Motorist Club, I'm sorry to tell you, you're not insured at all. Don't use your vehicle. Call the incident room direct on 01234 842 660. Now, the insurance industry has no compensation scheme, so you'll have to buy another policy. But don't drive without one. It's a serious offence. At least you can help stop this fraudster hurting other people. So take a look at this man, Alfred Higgins, once again. He has an Irish accent. If you know where he is now, please call us here at the studio on 0500 600 600 or call local police direct on 01 234 842 660. That's Bedford, 842 660. Now, talking of cars, someone broke into two vehicles in Birmingham, stole money and other possessions and left a trail of other crimes in his wake. Credit cards taken from the cars were used to open credit accounts at retail stores. Here's the man responsible. He's tall, slim and in his late 20s. Who is he? Here he is at another store, this time in Chesterfield, where he was rumbled. Do tell us who he is on 0500 600 600. That's our free call number. 0500 600 600. Or you can call officers direct on 01 909 500 That's Worksop 500 and now to Surrey and a series of attacks which date back more than five years. All have been on teenage girls. The perpetrator, pa perpetrator might be a tramp, a mental patient, or if you live in Surrey or South London, maybe he's even a neighbour. He's tall, he's thin, he's scruffy, smelly, and he walks with a slight limp. The latest in his disturbing sequence of offences was on Monday the 10th of June. For obvious reasons, an actress plays the victim and reads extracts from her statement. I thought she'd been in a school fight um, and it was only when I got close to her that I realised it, it wasn't. It was like an explosion of absolute horror that, would, that something so awful as this could happen to our daughter. I saw a man in the field on my right. I can only say that he was a white man and was walking in the direction of Riddlesdown School. I didn't think anything of it and I carried on walking. I don't know how long after, but soon I turned around and I saw a white skinny man with grey scruffy hair. He reminded me of a tramp. He was really smelly and scruffy and he stank of B.O. 
What are you doing? Oh, I'm waiting for my dad. He's a policeman. What's your name? Sarah. Oh, go away from me. My dad's a policeman. To all intents and purposes, this was uh, equivalent to a rape in broad daylight, and we're treating it very seriously. And one of the first things we had to do was obviously find out if there'd been any previous attacks. One thing that proved crucial was that the victim's mother made sure her daughter didn't wash until forensic swabs were taken and genetic information recovered from the samples. As a result of the DNA analysis, we found out that there'd been three previous serious indecent assaults, all committed by the same man, at a place 12 miles away from here. And this is Telegraph Hill in Claygate, Surrey, where the previous attacks took place between August 1991 and August 95. All the victims were schoolgirls or teenagers, but other children or older women may have had uneasy encounters with the man and not reported him to the police. He's described as aged between 45 and 50, between 5 foot 10 and 6 foot 2 inches tall. He's a slim build and he's got scruffy grey hair. Now, with that description, together with details about the method he uses, which is very specific, we've been able to establish that he's responsible for a total of nine attacks. He had uh, really scabby skin, which looked like um, dried up eczema all over his face and all over his legs. He had a uh, very distinctive mark on his left knee. It's a scar about the size of a teaspoon. And it's as though it's, it's someone's thrown a stone or, or scooped out with an ice cream scoop. It's quite dented. Now, two other victims have seen this scar, and the description of the scar is an eliminating factor. So if he doesn't have a scar, it can't be our man. More than three hours before the assault, a woman walking across Riddlesdown Common noticed a man whose behaviour made her decide to take a detour home. Then some three hours later... Well, as I took my dog for a walk, I saw Sainsbury shopping bag, and then there was a dog. I went to say hello to the dog, hello. and then this man's head appeared out of the grass. Again, he may well be innocent, but who was he? Shortly after the attack on the chalk footpath leading to Riddlesdown Common from Godston Road, a couple recalled passing a man who was heading down towards the road. Oh, there is deep hill. Yeah, it appears off at the top. <laughs> did he walk home then, or did he have a car there, or did he go by train or bus? Do you recall him? The day after the attack, um, I was in here with her, and she, she was just sat on the um, on the sofa. And I, I came in, and um, one of the things that she said to me was, "I just wondered at what stage he was, at what stage he was going to kill me." And I thought, you know, just what right has it? Anybody got to do that? Well, one of the repercussions of that is that the poor girl was so frightened she may meet her attacker again that the family is now planning to move away from the area. Detective Superintendent Brian Younger, you know so much about this man. He must yes. be very easily identifiable. That's right, and I'm convinced someone watching tonight could put a name to this man. Uh, we know so much about him. We've been able to link him on DNA method and especially the description, with particular emphasis on this scar on his left knee. So as you said in the film, if he hasn't got a, left, a scar on his left knee, he isn't your man. That's right. That's absolutely right. No scar. He can't be the man. Remind us again what he looks like. Right, he's uh, between 45 and 50 years of age. He's about 5 foot 10 to 6 foot 2 inches tall. Slim build with grey scruffy hair. He may have eczema and we think he walks with a limp. Now what else do you know about him? We know that he has a penchant for sunglasses, I think. That's right. In virtually all of the other attacks, he's been known to wear sunglasses and the last victim has identified these sunglasses as being similar to the ones that she thinks he was uh, carrying with him. And they are Oakley sunglasses with the Oakley motif in the middle. Also, three of the other victims have actually uh, identified him as wearing these type of sandals. Now, these sandals are 
you know, not unique, but they are unusual to go with an expensive pair of uh, sunglasses. Mm -hmm. So if you know someone who has such a combination, we'd obviously like to hear from them as well. Now, what about the sightings that were shown in the reconstruction? How significant are they, do you believe? Right, well, the man seen going towards the Rose and Crown public house in the Godstone Road is obviously, we think, the suspect. But where did he go when he got there? Was it a bus? Was it a car? What transport did he take away from the scene? Now, as we, sh as we saw, the most recent assault in June was in Kenley. But he's been more prevalent, perhaps, 12 miles away in Claygate over the last four or five years. Does that suggest that he may have moved house or knows both areas quite well? That is a possibility. He may have moved into the Kenley area and he may attack again there, or it may be that he was just visiting friends. We don't know yet which way it was. But as we've said earlier, he is so identifiable, isn't he? Someone must know who he is. That is absolutely right. And the reason for this appeal is we're convinced that one of your viewers tonight will know who this man is. Now, he will attack again. There is absolutely no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. And we're convinced that if they ring in with this man's name, they can stop another attack. Brian Younger, thank you very much. As you said, his record is such that he is very likely to attack again. Well, here is the number. It's 0500 600 600. That is the free call number here. Or you might like to try the incident room direct on 018. 0181-667-1212. That's 0181-667-1212. Now here's Detective Constable Jackie Haynes. First a man you won't want to be befriend, it's David Christopher Goff, who's 19 and has a habit of stealing friends' credit cards and documents. Here he is trying to cash a cheque taken from one of them. The cashier was suspicious and Goff ran away. He has had some success, though, obtaining a green Audi A4 TDI, which he's probably still got. He put false plates on it, P77MDP. David Goff may use the name Matthew Hewitt. He's a canoeing instructor and is very sociable, so beware. If you know where he is or the car is, his friends and detectives would like to speak to him. 0500 600 600 or call the local officers direct on 01522 532 -322. That's Lincoln, 532 two. And this man isn't too popular with acquaintances either. Here he is in Luton, Bedfordshire, withdrawing someone's savings. This is the fourth time he'd plundered the account and even set up his own overdraft facility, presumably happy to bankrupt his victim. He's Kevin Eric Michael Mantle, 41, but he does look older. Average height with grey-white hair. He was in Dublin not long ago, but where is he now? 0500 600 600 or call the local police on 01707 354 004. That's Welling Garden City 354 004. Well, a very strong response so far, only uh, 20 minutes or so into the programme. Uh, 52 calls on the Peterborough armed robbery, um, tw at least 13 names of uh, describing the man in the EFIT, names also coming in for a second man, and there have been sightings of the Cortina in Peterborough, and also sightings of a similar Euro truck, as we uh, discussed earlier. A good response to the Mesco bullet, uh, suggestions that the weapon could have been used, and um, some suggestion that it's purchased in Germany or through mail order. Alfred Higgins, uh, the car insurance fraud. We've had three calls on that so far. A lot of calls coming in on already some of the cases that we've featured. The Midlands Deceiver, we've had one name just put in now. So do keep calling. If you can't get through, the phones will be answered eventually, I promise. Now some pin-sharp video of three youths trying and very nearly bungling a robbery in Essex. Here they are. They're all in their late teens or early twenties. They're in a building society in Chelmsford. Now this is just over a week ago. We often complain, don't we, about the bad positioning of security cameras or useless equipment, but as you can see here, the images are crystal clear. And watch their panic as they find that they can't get out. Well, do give us a call, 0500 600 600 here in the studio, or you can call on 01245 452 120. That's 01245, the code for Chelmsford, 452 120. You must have read about the next case. Not surprisingly, it made headlines. Ten days ago, a 73-year-old grandmother was raped while posting a letter near her home in Lincolnshire. It happened at 9 o'clock in the morning in the picturesque village of Tetney near Grimsby. The victim, Vera Leva, who had been in perfect health, in fact looked younger than she was, died a few hours later from a massive stroke. In fact, she just got home from a hospital examination. She was having a bath to wash away the traces of the crime. Under English law, the rapist probably can't be charged with murder. 
but the detective on the quarry, D.R. Neil Jones, has little doubt that the rape led to the stroke. And in fact, you're, you're treating it just like a murder inquiry. We are. It's an appalling incident, and we are treating it as a murder case. How much do you know about the rapist? She, she was obviously able to give you, before she died, she was interviewed by you, so she was able to give you a description. Yes, Mrs. Labour obviously spoke to us and gave us a description. She told us he's a man about 30 to 40 years old. He's 5 foot 11 to 6 feet. He's stocky, well built. We know he had a beard of about two days old. He was unshaven. She said he was in dark clothing, uh, probably a coarse jacket, blue jeans, uh, may have been charcoal grey colour, uh, and he had a body odour. Uh, one of the distinctive things was that he had this black woolen hat. One of your colleagues said that the victim and another witness thought he had sort of odd eyes. That's right. The Mrs. Lavery, who was very close to him, described him as having piercing eyes. And another lady who actually saw him on the alleyway earlier, about 20 minutes before the attack, again said he had piercing, intimidating eyes. Now, let's just look at where this attack took place so that people can picture where what part of the country you're looking in. It's likely to be in Lincolnshire, North Lincolnshire, this man comes from, is it? I mean, this took place near Grimsby. Yeah, that, that's correct. We've done inquiries in Tetney itself, and we've spoken to everybody in the village. He went off the main road, so he was obviously walking around the village for, for some time. That's, he was in the village probably half an hour, and then he moved off. The last sighting was on the Halton Road towards Haltonley Clay, so he may have been walking that way or even towards Grimsby. We're very really need witnesses who can actually identify him and, and see him in Holtonley Clay or in Tetney to identify him for us. Is he a settled man? Could he have just wandered in? Could he be a vagrant? Could he be mentally ill? Have you any uh, other clues? We have no other clues than the fact that he must be familiar to Tetney, he knew the back lanes, he knew these alleyways, somebody must know him, so he was familiar to Tetney. But no, I don't think he lives in Tetney, and he was moving off way towards Holtonley Clay. OK, if you've seen anything uh, suspicious in that area, here's the number, 0500 600 600. And the incident room number, where officers are waiting, 0152-558-328. That's Lincoln, 558-328. Here now is Superintendent David Hatcher again. A nasty crime on public transport next. Two Absolutely. men who threatened a passenger with a machete and seemed to have a gun. This is London Bridge Railway Station, way back in February. The victim, who's aged 18, ran through the station in panic. But who are these two still following him? One had a distinctive pineapple hairstyle. He's huge, maybe six foot four. And the other is much shorter, five foot eight, and had horizontal lines shaved through his sideburns. 0500 600 600 and do call us right away. Or call the British Transport Police on 0171 957 1123. That's 0171 957 1123. And do please call us if you've encountered this man. He's James Patrick Murray. Back in March, a man was shot in a car in Huddersfield. James Murray may be able to help with the inquiry. He's average height, slim build, with a swallow tattooed on both forearms. If you see him, don't approach him. He may still be armed. Call us instead on 0500 600 600 here in the studio or call local officers direct on 01484 436 495. That's Huddersfield, 436 495. Well, let's now take you back to August. Easy date for me to remember August the 7th, my birthday. A crime took place in Birmingham that day, August the 7th, that even heavy gangsters will deplore. After all, who would take children hostage in a bank robbery and then threaten to blow their heads off? Here are the children. The boy's 11, the girl's 13. This is in Coventry Road, Small Heath. A man in a balaclava races in wielding a handgun. An accomplice has a sawn-off shotgun. The man grabs the girl and warns that he will shoot her. Money is passed out through the screens. He rams it into a puma holdall and then both run out. In fact, the money is booby-trapped and everyone in the street watches in astonishment as a red smoke and dye burst out of the bag. Here's an e-fit of one of the gunmen. Give us a call, please, and turn him in. 0500 600 600. That's our free call number, 0500 600 600. Or you can call the police locally on 0121 626 7077. That's Birmingham, 626 7077. And now a mini, or should I say a micro, Aladdin's cave, except this stuff hasn't been recovered. It's gone missing. These are replicas of antiques stolen from Swale in Kent in what might be a huge series of burglaries and car thefts. Now, this is called Spelter. It's a spelter urn. Spelter is a zinc alloy popular in Germany. 
Don't see, you don't learn things on Crime Watch. This one's uh, an ornate urn with horses and then four dolphins at the base. And this Victoria Salva is even more distinctive because it bears an inscription. High Bickington, which I think is in Devon, 1897, Reverend E.R. Yarbrough. And now let me introduce you to the Lady Immortal, a Chinese lacquered figure with a fawn fawning at her feet. She's early 18th century and one of only six in the UK. And here is one of the burglars. He might be a group of, part of a group of gypsies approaching householders for odd jobs in rural Kent. He's described as having a lined and weathered face and he's roughly 40. Do call please if you can help 0500 600 600 or 01795 584 173. That's the code for Sittingbourne 01795 584 173. Now, if Crime Watch often gets the hardest crimes to crack, the toughest of them all are often murders where the victim is a prostitute. No one wants to know, or those who do are perhaps too worried for their reputations to come forward. And that is the case with Jackie Gallagher from Paisley, who was murdered in the early hours of a Monday morning in June. She was a part-time prostitute who took heroin as well, and so far the police have had very little help from members of the public. But Jackie Gallagher deserved much better. I just feel that the public in general are just looking at newspapers and reading Jacqueline prostitute hooker. I mean, it really doesn't matter what Jacqueline did. She was a human being, and I think the public have got to understand this. She was a lovely girl. It didn't matter what she did. She was still my daughter. And I'm just asking the public if, if they do know anything to come forward, whether it's trivial to them but it may be held the police. It's Monday, the 24th of June. Jackie left her home in Fox Bar to make the 50-minute journey into Glasgow city centre. She got to Bothwell Street at half past one, was seen by a colleague and a friend she'd met while working on the streets. Hey, yeah, you're not going home already, are you? Nah, I haven't any fags. Would you mind running me down the garage? Oh, here, here. Have one of mine. Oh, thanks. I'll need some more for later on. Oh, jump in then, I'll take you down there. Uh... Are you through here tonight, no? Nah, I've not seen her. I would often see Jackie in the square and she would give me a wave and I would stop and talk to her. Over the weeks, I saw her many times. Only once did she ask me if I wanted business. I declined because I thought she was too nice a lassie. I didn't want to be regarded by her as a punter. They drove to the Burma garage in Broomilaw, where Jackie was recorded by the security video at 1.31 a.m. Ten club, please. 1.47. Thank you. Cheers, thanks. They left the garage a minute later and then went to buy some soft drinks. Jackie was then seen arriving in Bothwell Street just after 2 a.m. Would you mind hanging about and giving me a lift home later? No, but don't leave it too long. I'll hang about till three, then I'll come back and pick you up here, okay? Okay, cheers, thanks. See you later. Take care. See you later then. Bye. Bye. See you. Bothwell Street is a regular haunt for prostitutes, but Jackie didn't come into the city centre that often. When she did, she'd take up a pitch under the clock at the junction of Blythewood Street. 20 minutes later, at 2.27, a black BMW was seen in the area. Who was the driver? When the taxi driver eventually left, Jackie was still standing at the corner. He was the last known person to see her alive. I wasn't too bothered when she didn't turn up because she'd kept me waiting in the past. 
I thought she'd maybe get back to her flat with a punter. At about the same time, a black BMW was spotted passing the corner where Jackie was last seen. I was travelling along the A82 towards the Eskin Bridge when my attention was drawn to Lee Bay just before bowling and I saw a black BMW. It looked like a five series motor vehicle sitting in the Lee Bay and I could see a man dressed in denim jacket, denim jeans, walking away from the vehicle towards Uncle Patrick. Five hours later, Jackie's body was discovered in the same lay-by. Police sealed off the scene. Detective Chief Inspector Jeanette Joyce arrived to take charge, and scenes of crime officers gathered to preserve the evidence. I think it's terrible that Jacqueline's body was just dumped with an old curtain wrapped around her. I mean, a sick animal gets put to sleep with some dignity. My daughter never got that choice. I know that Jacqueline will never rest herself, so whether Jacqueline is lying in a cold morgue or whether she was buried, it's, she's still not going to rest. She'll not be resting to the person's caught that killed her, that took her life. And I'll never rest either. Heartfelt, heartfelt words of a loving mother. Detective Chief Inspector Jeanette Joyce, this was an utterly ruthless and brutal murder, wasn't it? Yes, it was a very violent attack for no apparent reason. Jacqueline suffered very severe injuries, which leads me to believe that her attacker could well have been bloodstained and may in fact be injured himself. Now, let's look at some of the major clues you have. As we know, Jackie's body was wrapped in a curtain. Now, we have an exact copy of the one that was at the scene, don't we, here? It's quite a long one, about nine feet by five feet. Yes, it's quite an unusual curtain. In fact, we believe it has been hung in a building a pre built pre-World War II or, in fact, a tenement flat. Now, when the curtain is found, there are actually hooks in the curtain, and we have one on display tonight. Yes, this one here. It's a common or garden plastic curtain hook, but it's unusual to find a curtain still with the hooks in. Yes, very much so. Another unusual aspect of this curtain is the lining, which is not standard curtain lining. It's white dressmaking cotton with a blue polka dot design. Very unusual. And I am of the impression that this curtain has been made on a domestic sewing machine. It's very roughly made, so anyone who remembers making a curtain like this, or indeed perhaps selling the material, anyone like that you'd like to hear from? Yes, absolutely. It would be a vital step forward for this inquiry. Now, what about the cars, the BMW? Three sightings of a BMW. Significant? Yes, obviously we cannot ignore the fact that two black-coloured BMW motor cars were seen driving about the area where Jacqueline was last seen. However, more significantly, about quarter past four that Monday morning, the 24th of June, there is a black-coloured car seen in the lay-by where Jacqueline's body was later found. And we believe that that car is a 5 Series BMW. And I would ask the driver of that vehicle to come forward so we can eliminate him from the inquiry. And there was also a man in denims and a denim shirt. Yes, he was seen walking away from the car. And I believe he may have seen something important to this inquiry. Now, as we said earlier, Jackie was a prostitute, so therefore your inquiry must be made that much more difficult because potential witnesses, people who knew her, who saw her that night, may be obviously reticent to come forward. Yes, it's been made very difficult. However, as Jacqueline's mum, Alice, said in the reconstruction, it doesn't matter what Jacqueline was, she was a human being first and foremost. And really, I would wish people to be more forthcoming in this inquiry, especially clients who were with Jacqueline on the Monday night, the 24th of June. It doesn't matter why they were with Jacqueline, but what they saw and what they can tell us about Jacqueline's movements after two o'clock that morning are absolutely vital. Well, thank you very much indeed, Jeanette Joyce. Well, here is the number. Please call. Please, please call. Tre calls will be treated with the greatest discretion, I promise. And you can speak to officers or perhaps BBC staff if you prefer. That's our free call number. Or you can try the incident room in Dumbarton. That's 01389 822 000. That's Dumbarton 822 000. And now here's Detective Constable Jackie Hames again with a couple of con men, including someone we featured once before. In all, nine police forces are now seeking Edwin Willis, and so are lots of very unhappy people. He's conned out of 
their livelihoods or savings. He's 47 tall, heavily built with tattoos on his arms and fingers and has a West Country accent. He uses all sorts of different names including Edwin Lawson and Sean Luckett. 0500 600 600 or call locally on 01609 789 460. That's North Allerton 789 460. And this is Christopher Cornave. There's a warrant issued for him on 17 counts of fraud and deception. Watch out for him, especially if you work in a bank or building society or if you work in a small business. And he's easy to spot. He's six foot three and heavily built. He looks scruffy in the picture, but he's normally well dressed. 0500 600 600, or you can ring the fraud squad on 01772 618 973. That's Preston in Lancashire, 618 973. Finally, a tragic case. Sarah Lucas, who lived in Bisley in Surrey with her long term partner Stephen O'Callaghan. Two weeks ago, Sarah was strangled and Stephen disappeared. Police are anxious to question him, but they're also very concerned for his safety. They're worried he may be suicidal. He might be in central London or on the south coast. If you've seen him anywhere, please call 0500 600 600 or call the local police on 01276. 27131. That's Camberley 27131. On calls, and I'm sorry, the lines are jammed at the moment, and you might have difficulty getting through, but persevere. On uh, Surrey, two callers think the suspect comes from uh, Croydon in Surrey. Uh, Eleven names have been given, one name has come up twice. Uh, on the Peterborough armed robbery, we've now had well over 70 calls, 21 names so far. Again, one name has come up twice. We've had dozens of calls on the Mesco bullet. Thanks very much for that. The police really probably have enough on that, and they think they know where the bullet came from and possibly where the firearm came from as well. Some quite interesting material on the background to Hajit Singh as well. In fact, uh, there's more information just coming through on Alfred Higgins, uh, wanted for the car insurance fraud as well. John. Well, that's it for this month. Our lines are open until midnight, 0500 600 600. They're very busy, as Nick said. That's for any of our cases. And if you have any information, please keep trying. I promise you will get through. If you know something on any crime that we haven't covered, then you can call Crime Stoppers. They're on 0800 555 one. Well, we'll be back a month from now. Remember, we're on Tuesdays. And remember, remember, the 5th of November. That's Guy Fawkes Night, our next programme, November the 5th. In the meantime, don't forget we'll be back tonight with Crime Watch Update at 11.40. And if you can't stay up till then, don't have nightmares, do sleep well. Good night. Good night. response to several of our cases tonight we've just heard this minute that following a car chase a man is now in custody and more than 250 calls on the assaults of teenage girls in Surrey one or two very interesting leads there many many calls on the murder of the prostitute Jackie Gallagher in Glasgow some significantly linking names to black BMWs in the area Nick well first the heroics of a passerby in Peterborough who single-handedly intervened to try to stop a gang involved in an armed robbery the bullet fired at him turned out to be a blank. You recovered that, that blank and you've had dozens of calls about it. We have. We've had a phenomenal amount of calls about where you can buy that ammunition and the, the number of lines of inquiry we've now got to follow on that. OK, you don't need any more calls about Mesco cartridges. No, none at all. What about the gang involved, the, the, the men? Did you get any other witnesses, any people who identified them? Yes, we've had a, at least 20 names been put forward by uh, various members of the public and uh, we're still going through the, the calls we've had. Um, quite a phenomenal um, response, over 200 calls has been received. 
and with quite a few names been put forward to us. Anybody able to identify where that car was? There was a, a Ford Cortina, a V-registered Cortina estate, which disappeared, and you're only interested in where it was one night, which is Thursday the 1st of August. That's right. We've had a lot of information about Ford Cortinas, but the, the date we're talking about is, is that, that Cortina on that, that the 1st and 2nd of August. And you haven't had that call yet, no. which, is, which is... No. Are you pleased overall? I'm pleased overall with the response we've had, yes. Good. Chill. Well, now to the attack on the schoolgirl in Kenley, Surrey, which is now being linked to a series of disturbing assaults over several years. What are you doing? I'm waiting for my dad. He's a policeman. What's your name? Sarah. Oh, go away from me. My dad's a policeman. Brian Younger, huge wad of responses Absolutely. to your right there. Yes, over 170 calls into the uh, studio and over 100 to my own Instagram. room. Interesting leads, do you know, so yes, far? Yes, some very interesting ones, especially people described as having uh, a limp, which could mean that they do have a scar. Obviously, they may not have seen the scar. And, uh, yes, yeah, it's going to be useful. Remind us again about the man you want to, you want to catch. Right, he's 45 to 50 years of age. He's about 5 foot 10 to 6 foot 2 inches tall, slim build with grey, scruffy hair. He may have uh, eczema, and as we've said, he does walk with a limp, and he's got this very distinguishable scar on his left knee if people actually get a chance to see it. We have some more clues here in the studio, as we showed earlier. The sunglasses he's been known to wear on one or two occasions. That's right. He seems to be using those or wearing those uh, on every attack so far. And also, these sandals have been seen on at least three or four occasions. Uh, yeah, so it's an unusual combination, expensive sunglasses and everyday sandals. And these, as I say, these attacks occurred in Kenley, the last most recent one, and in the Claygate area four or five years previous to that. That's right, over a period of five years, a total of nine attacks. Well, let's hope you get your man, Brian. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, it's been a very positive evening. We've had, uh, on that Midlands Deceiver case, four names suggested. In fact, one of those names has been given by two different callers. In relation to the... the... the uh, Small Heath Bank robbery, we've had one name given by an off-duty officer for the gunman and also an address to follow up there. Then in relation to the Kent burglary, we, that EFIT, we've got two names suggested. One of them has uh, given details of a van with the business telephone number attached to it that we've got something to follow up on. Then moving on to London Bridge, that attempted robbery, three names have been given, one of them in the London area. Remember, that was the two characters, one very, very tall, six foot four guy, mixed with a, uh, a very short five foot eight guy in, re in uh, relation to that. And then lastly, Chelmsford robbery, enormous number of calls, one name has been given twice, and there's an address to follow up there as well. Well, now the death of Vera Lever, uh, not in law a murder, she, but she died soon after being raped. She'd been out just posting a letter early one morning near her home at Tetney, which is near Grimsby. That was ten days ago, Friday, September the 20th. D.I. Neil Jones is hunting for the man who attacked her and uh, who almost certainly contributed to her death. Just got off the phone to somebody. I mean, the calls have been coming in actually surprisingly quickly and readily, considering how little you had to go on. on That's case. right. We've had uh, about nearly 40 calls, actually. We have about nine people named. We have witnesses who have actually seen this man on the Holtony Clay Road. That's where. That's the road going out of Tetney towards Grimsby? That's correct, and that was on the, the morning of the murder after the attack. So we're very pleased with the information we've received. And there we see a map of roughly where the attack uh, took place. It was in the, in the village of, of Tetney, and more witnesses there were most improbable, but, but the fact that you've got other people citing the man on the road out of that village is, is important to you. It's very important to us, and we also have people who are actually named uh, within that village, so they're people that we've got to check out, obviously. Good. Thanks very much indeed. Well, first of all, on that Kevin Eric Mantle case, again, a number of calls, all sightings in the Welling Garden City and the Luton area, and there are strong leads to follow up where, on where the guy is thought to live and also bars that he's thought to frequent. Then we move to Edwin Terence Willis, one sighting, and we think he may be in hospital, so that's being followed up now. In relation to that case too, Bristol Police have called because they think they've got a case that also links in to Edwin Terence Willis. Then... On uh, Christopher Cornave, we've had ten calls to the fraud squad in Preston. One is an extremely hot lead, which adds to what officers already know. And then lastly, Alfred Higgins, well, we've had 16 calls there on that Teleshore insurance fraud, a very positive sighting in Ireland, and detectives are following that one up, and they're convinced that the information they've been given is correct. 
Well, now the murder of Jackie Gallagher in Glasgow in June. Jackie was a part-time prostitute who vanished from her pitch in Bothwell Street. A black BMW was seen around that time, and another was seen in a lay-by where later that morning Jackie's body was discovered. Jeanette Joyce, until tonight the response had been fairly slow. Are you encouraged by things this evening? Very much so. So far, we've had over 50 calls to both here to the studios at Crime Watch UK and also to the incident room at Dumbarton. And I would appeal to the public, please, please keep the calls coming in. Particularly people who saw her on that night, June Absolutely. the 24th. Absolutely. It's vital we, we trace people who saw Jackie on the night in question. Now, we have this curtain here, which, as we said earlier, is an exact copy of the curtain that Jackie's body was wrapped in. Tell us a bit more about this. Well, the curtain itself, I believe, is a one-off because I've already said I believe it's made in a domestic sewing machine. As I say, it's a one-off, and I want to hear from the person who made that curtain. Please, please telephone us now. Do the right thing. Mm. And it is very long. It's about nine feet by five feet, and you believe it may have been in a tenement building? or Well, we think by its measurements it may have been hung in a tenement building or a house built before World War II. Now, a lot of the calls coming in have been linking names to black BMWs. You still want those to come forward? Absolutely. Any piece of information at all is vital to this inquiry. Jeanette Joyce, thank you. I can confirm that while we've been on air, a man has been arrested. He's being taken back for questioning now. I can't, for legal reasons, divulge which case it is. The call's still coming in now, 10 to 12. The lines are going to close here any moment, but uh, do keep trying if you've got any information on any of these cases. But that's about it for this month. We will be back on Tuesday night, a month from now. Remember, remember, the 5th of November. That's for Crime Watch on Guy Fawkes Night. And till then, of course, ten of nightmares do sleep well. Good night. Good night.